Hello and welcome to another edition of Zog Science. Today we're going to be taking a look at viruses and bacteria. Uh, we're going to be exploring some of the characteristics of uh, these things. So, um, what are sort of one of the things we all, you know, tend to can look at is uh, measles, mumps, herpes, and polio. And what do these diseases have in common? Well, they are all caused by viruses. Uh, and one of the big questions that always comes about uh, when we're talking about viruses uh, is, are viruses alive? So they looked alive, they kind of act like they're alive, but really they're not living things. Uh, and they differ from living things in a couple different ways. Uh, first of all, they can only reproduce inside another organism. They cannot reproduce on their own. Uh, they don't have any metabolism on their own. Again, they just take over the, meta the me metabolic structures of the cell they are infecting. And they don't have any organelles, so things like nucleus, mitochondria, um, none of that stuff, they don't have any of it. And finally, they're composed of only a nucleic acid, uh, either DNA or RNA, uh, inside a protein capsule. So they don't really have, they don't really fit the bill for what we consider a living thing. Uh, so what is the structure of a virus? Okay, we just kind of talked about that. Here's some different pictures. Uh, we've got the bacteriophage. Uh, bacteriophage means that this is phage means virus, so this is a virus that infects bacteria. Um, we've got the adenovirus. Uh, this is what the flu looks like. All right, so we've got a DNA or RNA coat on the inside, or sorry, a DNA or RNA uh, molecule on the inside, and then a protein capsid, that just basically means a capsule going around it, some sort of, you know, structure here, and then uh, tail fibers. And what these are used for is used for attaching to the host cell that it is going to be infected. Um, we also can have these other ones, kind of capsule-shaped ones. Um, again, there's going to be uh, the DNA, on, the, or in this case, RNA on the inside. Uh, there's a couple of enzymes that come with here, so reverse transcriptase is important for HIV in terms of when it does its infection, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then again, there's a protein coat around the outside, and in this case, there are a couple different layers of those protein coats. So viral reproduction, how exactly do viruses reproduce? Well, first of all, they have to attach themselves to the host cell, right? Uh, once they've attached themselves, they're gonna inject it with the nucleic acid, either the DNA or the RNA, so that gets injected inside. And then the nucleic acid is going to command the cell to make more viruses. So it's going to uh, incorporate itself into the, the genome, or it's just going to take over the, the processes that, that make the cell do things, um, produce copies of itself. So it's going to produce more and more uh, DNA and more and more proteins. It's going to have those basically be assembled. And then when there's so many of them that the cell is full, uh, it's going to burst open. We call this uh, lytic infection. So lysis is breaking open of a cell. So this is a lytic infection because it is breaking open the cell. There is another type of infection called a lysogenic infection where the uh, virus just takes over the cell and doesn't actually kill it. It's just every time the cell reproduces, it produces another virus. Um, so th that's a slightly different type. I'm not going to expect you to know the difference between the, those two. So the cell then ruptures, releasing hundreds of new viruses that, again, repeat the cycle. So we also have these things called retroviruses, and no, they're not from the 70s. Uh, these viruses store their genetic information as RNA. So rather than it just being DNA and that getting automatically transferred over, they have it stored as RNA. And what happens, a good example of this is HIV. Uh, and so here's sort of the life cycle of the HIV. So again, the virus has to attach to the surface. It's going to release its RNA into the cell, and cells use DNA as their genetic material. So the RNA has to be converted into DNA, which is why it's called reverse transcriptase, because it has to take the RNA, turn it into DNA first, and then the DNA is combined into the nucleus, uh, RNA copies are made, which are then uh, bundled with the new virus proteins and form a new virus, which is then sent out. So a di slightly different you know, sort of take on how a virus works. Uh, 
Uh, now, let's talk about bacteria, okay? Bacteria, there's a couple different groupings. We've got uh, archaeobacteria and eubacteria. Okay, they are unicellular prokaryotes, which means they're only one-celled, and they're prokaryotes, which means they do not have a nucleus. Uh, they're divided into two kingdoms, like I mentioned, eubacteria and archaeobacteria. Eubacteria means true bacteria, so eu means true, um, just like a eukaryote would be a true cell. And your eubacteria are kind of what we traditionally think of as bacteria. Archaeobacteria, okay, let's think about what archae means. Um, archaeology, okay, so old, so these are like our old bacteria, things that have been around for a very long time evolutionarily. Um, they are not as advanced as eubacteria, um, but they do have some very cool traits like being able to live in extreme temperatures, um, in hot springs, uh, in very salt, very salty conditions like the Dead Sea, uh, things like that. Uh, they can be either heterotrophs or autotrophs, and what that means is that they can either make their own uh, food or they can consume other food. Um, a lot of them use chemosynthesis, and particularly the RK bacteria. And they're classified based on the shape, type of cell wall, and the movement. So our different shapes are cocci, bacilli, and spirilla. And the cocci are kind of spherical um, shapes. Bacilli are kind of rod shaped, so a little bit more elongated. And then the spirilla are kind of spiral shaped. Uh, the structure of a bacteria, all right, we've got our cell membrane. Cell membrane is going to be going around the outside of the cell. It's going to regulate what goes in and out of the cell. We've got a cell wall just outside of that that's going to give it some structure and protection, part of the reason why bacteria are hard to kill. We've got our DNA in the inside, and bacterial DNA is actually circular, so it is uh, all connected. It doesn't have loose ends like uh, human DNA does. And then we've got our ribosomes, our protein producers. Our <coughs> protein producers on the inside. We've also got the cytoplasm. That's just the space inside the cell membrane. Uh, and then we've got these flagella and the pili. Those are going to help the uh, bacteria to move around. So the flagella kind of wave around and propel the bacteria through whatever substance it is. Um, and same thing with the pili. Uh, so when we talk about uh, the cell walls, okay, you bacteria have peptidoglycan, um, and peptidoglycan is a mix of proteins and carbohydrates, so it's actually a sugar protein mix um, that is very strong. Um, and they have lipids in their cell walls that are not necessarily present in our RK bacteria. And what we can do is we can um, basically separate out the U bacteria into two different types, uh, gram positive or gram negative. And your, that kind of just gives you uh, a way to classify um, the bacteria. So right here, these are our gram-positive bacteria. They're kind of purple appearing. And your gram-negative bacteria are kind of pink appearing. And your gram-positive bacteria are in general, not all the time, but in general are more disease-causing. So gram-positive um, generally do more damage. Uh, now, how do bacteria grow and reproduce? Okay, well, mainly how they reproduce is through a process called binary fission, and that's basically when the bacteria gets big enough, it, and when it's doubled its size, it's going to copy its DNA, so uh, go through DNA replication is what we call that, and divide into two new cells, um, and they're going to be genetically identical because the DNA was copied. It's kind of like identical twins, uh, except um, the bacteria are even more similar than uh, identical. Uh, we also have a process called conjugation. Um, so this is where a hollow bridge is going to form between two bacteria, and actually the DNA is going to be passed back and forth. Usually this happens in a structure called a plasmid, and we're going to be talking a lot about plasmids once we get to our biotechnology unit. Um, and then we can have something called spore formation. So what happens is that if it's like very dry, um, there's not a lot of food around, you know, uh, some sort of unfavorable condition, the bacteria can um, essentially dry itself out and protect the DNA and the cytoplasm into a hard spore that will survive for a very, very long time. Now, one of the things we tend to think about is we think that bacteria are always bad, but that's not necessarily the case. You know, they cause things like strep throat, tetanus, meningitis, tuberculosis, but a lot of times they can be useful. Um, for example, we have E. coli in our stomachs that helps us to digest our food, and specifically it helps us to digest plant material, cellulose. 
Uh, many are important decomposers in the ecosystem, so we need bacteria to break down dead things. Otherwise, we would have a lot of dead things in the woods or, you know, just everywhere, and that would obviously not be good because we'd just be walking around in dead stuff. Uh, rhizobium provides plants with nitrogen, which is huge. Um, one of the main limiting factors in plant growth is nitrogen. Um, that's why we have nitrogen-based fertilizers. Um, so rhizobium is a very important bacteria that naturally produces nitrogen um, for our plants. And there are some bacteria that are used to clean up oil spills in the ocean. Um, <coughs> for example, when the Horizon um, oil well went down, uh, they contained the oil using booms, and then they uh, introduced bacteria into that environment, and the bacteria just gobbled up all of the oil and turned it into things that were not harmful to the environment. Pretty cool. Uh, we're also going to be using some E. coli bacteria when we get to our um, uh, bi biotechnology unit again, and then we're gonna we're gonna make them glow in the dark. So something to look forward to. <coughs> now, vaccines. Okay, we need to think about sort of what are some ways that we can combat viruses and um, bacteria. Well, uh, we can use something called a vaccine. Okay. So what happens is that we use a weakened form of the pathogen, um, and a pathogen is a disease-causing agent, so either the virus or the bacteria, um, and, and we use that to stimulate the production of antibodies in our body, uh, in ourselves, so that that way our body can recognize when the actual virus shows up and take it down. Um, one of the problems with vaccines is that bacteria and viruses have very high reproductive rates, so they reproduce quickly, which means that you get a lot of mutations in the DNA. Uh, which means that they change the proteins that are on their outer coat, and that's what the antibodies help recognize is those proteins on the outer coat. <coughs> and then if the proteins have changed on the bacteria or virus, your body, even though they have antibodies, might not match up or probably will not match up with the specific ones. Um, so how does a vaccine work? Okay. <coughs> what happens is that you release um, basically a substance that is, looks very similar to the virus, the proteins that are on the virus or the bacteria. Uh, your body's B cells then produce um, antibodies, and those antibodies uh, uh, attach onto the uh, particles, and you go, we go through a series of processes that <coughs> produces cells that will long-term be able to mem remember those um, antigens. Now, I'm not going to expect you to remember all this at this point. I'm um, just kind of introducing it. Um, <coughs> there are kind of two um, forms of vaccines. Um, one is active. So this is where you're injected with the actual pathogen, and you get uh, basically permanent immunity. Uh, you also have passive. So this is where you just get the antibodies that help to fight it, but it's only temporary because your body doesn't actually remember it. All right, that's it for this edition of Zog Sites. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.